Hello, hello. Here we go. Uh, this is just me spinning. I'm working on a pocket scarf for a friend and I just couldn't find anything I liked so I decided, as usual, I spin my own. Now, I've already spun this ball right here and this is British Suffolk and what I'm spinning now is Hampshire. I'm going to apply those two together probably with a little cheviot somewhere and see if I can get a fairly decent consistent yarn. As always, I don't normally draft this close to the orifice, but uh, I'm trying to keep my view tight because pretty much I'm in this kind of cramped space with all this junk and I suppose I could just uh, move this stuff out of the way. Uh, well, a different day maybe. This is kind of on the fly here. So I'm using a worsted drafting technique, which is my default. And this is a short backwards draw. And I'm drawing to the length of the staple. I'd probably say this staple is about three inches. Sometimes it feels like a little more. Uh, very rarely less. Now, the British Suffolk was a really nicely carded and uh, smooth roving. Uh, I enjoyed it. This Hampshire is not quite as smooth and it has, uh, I'd say, a considerable amount of naps. So my guess would be that the Suffolk is probably machine roving and that this Hampshire is more than likely hand pulled. Not saying that someone can't get some seriously nice hand pull roving, but I know I don't even bother to hand pull my roving. I just card the stuff. And uh, when I'm carding for myself, I don't really see a need to card super smooth bats and then pull super smooth roving. For myself, I do try to get rid of most of the neps prior to the actual um, carding or combing or whatever I'm doing. So I don't worry too much about that. And then if I get the occasional one in here that I don't want in the yarn, then I just kind of pull it and flick it out. So if I get one in here, I'll flick it out. Basically, some people don't mind nips because they're like, well, it's texture. But I mind nips because eventually they will cause your item to peel. See, here's a big one right here. They will cause your item to peel and they will shed up in the garment. It's just the thing that happens. Unless, of course, you're, you've got something you've really fooled, fool, F-U-L-L, -L, <clears throat> and it kind of holds the neps in there. Now, because this is Hampshire, and that is Suffolk, uh, this is a garment that is not going to fool very much. The down breeds, like um, Suffolk, and the heel breeds, like Chevy out, of course, they all kind of operate about the same way. Dorset, all of those guys, Hampshire, they're basically what we like to refer to as nature superwash. Now, of course, anything will felt and fool if you give it enough agitation, but these breeds are particularly resistant to fooling and felting, which is why I'm spinning this scarf with this wool because it's going to someone who's on a farm and has uh, several children. So, hand washing things and leaving them to dry is, is kind of complicated. It's not something I want a busy mom on the farm to have to do with the scarf that she's going to wear out in the barn. So we want to make this as easy as possible. So I have a choice between superwash wools or to use kind of a, a natural superwash. And so that's kind of the purpose of this particular, using this particular breed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Most of the times, I like to choose breeds for the function of the garment. So I don't do a lot of blends uh, or uh, super wash. I just choose a breed that's more suitable for what it is I want it to do instead of blends. Except for uh, alpaca. I like alpaca blends, but I also use 100% of alpaca too. So in my next video, I'm going to card a bat of natural alpaca 
and some locks for texture and for color. Okay, so at any rate, back to this. I'm expecting to achieve something that is along the lines of a DK or a worsted weight yarn. Now, I could take out my spinach control card, uh, which is actually hanging off the spinning wheel, and I could use that spinach control card to measure the thickness of my single. But uh, as you can see, yeah, I mean, with exception for a few uh, parts where a little nip may have gone in, this is a pretty consistent single. How do I make them consistent? Well, first of all, um, it's it's a muscle memory. It's an eye memory because I have to kind of get a feel for being able to estimate how much fiber is in this drafting zone, pulling out consistent fiber in the drafting zone for a consistent thickness of a uh, single and uh, the right amount of twist because I could have a single like that and if I twist it down, then it will be thinner than what I'd like or if I smooth it too much. So there's a balance between being able to see how much fiber you need in the drafting zone uh, and being able to see that nip being uh, having a good understanding of how much twist to put into it. Okay, so I'm prepping here uh, in order to finish off. I'm almost done with this. And uh, you can see how nice and springy this wool is. And I just take my roving, my bats, all that kind of stuff. And draft it down. Split it all up to nice thin pieces. This is, this is thin enough. I mean, I could tear one more time and get something even thinner. But this is basically thin enough right here. Take that piece. And to join, I just lay it over top of the other piece and draft it out. And watch that, make sure it's not too thin. And so here we go again. I am all about spinning fast and furious. Okay, so most of the time I don't even touch the whirl in the front. Um, because what's happening is going on between how fast I'm turtling and how fast I'm drafting. I need to draft fast. I'm turtling like fast. You don't have to turtle that fast, but you know what? That's just the way I do it. So it's just one of those things. But also I need to be able to draft to match turtling. Now, like I said, I'm usually not this close to the orifice. I'm only this close to the orifice because that's the range in which you'll be able to view my hands in the camera and you still can't really view it really well. At some point I'll set it up better, but as uh, the winter approaches, the places where I can make videos kind of narrows down because I like to be warm. <laughs> and so, uh, well, we'll see. At any rate, what I would normally do for a a fiber that was a little longer is I would move with it and and do a short back or straw still pinching it worsted still smoothing it worsted but also I can um, I can draft faster moving in that direction because I'm not I don't have, it's not this small space of me inching forward towards the orifice and I'm kind of smoothing it as I go along so I'll have to Maybe take video when I'm at the studio next and show you that. And uh, I'm a production spinner. I mean, I spin, I, I don't really spin like small knit projects anymore, like a hundred yards here, a hundred yards there, only when I'm sampling. Now basically I'm spinning to weave. And so I'm spinning up, you know, a, a pound or more easily of fiber. 
And so I'm, I'm going fast and furious here and going for quantities. And the truth be told, I've pretty much always been like that because right after I learned to spin, I started taking spin for trades. So a lot of my learning experience has been um, for those spin for trade groups. And so I've always pretty much been spinning pounds of the same fiber at one time. And so it's get it done. Oh, almost lost that. It's get it done as fast and accurately as possible. And I've also learned that there are some shortcuts I can make because when you're weaving with hand spun and sometimes when you're knitting, I think I said something a long time ago about the knitting or weaving covers a multitude of mistakes. It really does. You don't see those tiny imperfections, depending of course on which pattern. If you're gonna do like a, a lace pattern, you're gonna want that yarn as smooth and consistent as possible. But there are a lot of patterns that are very forgiving and you cannot see the imperfectness of a hand spun yarn if that's what you're doing. So you don't have to be super 100% accurate all of the time in everything you spin for whatever purpose you're using. It depends. So don't take that to mean that I'm saying that uh, just whatever is good hand spun and uh, who cares whether it's smooth. I like my yarn smooth. I like my yarns the way I like my yarns. Uh, sometimes you would look at a commercial yarn and you couldn't tell my hand spun from a commercial yarn. It all depends on what I'm spinning, why I'm spinning it, you know, but I also know that when I'm going to weave this garment or knit some particular patterns that the whole process tends to iron out any small mistakes I've made in the spinning so that I don't have to uh, be completely 100% smooth all the time. Like there's a little little thickness right here. It's just a little thickness. I can see it. I don't know if you can see it, but when I apply this and whatever the next step is, knitting or weaving, you're not gonna be able to tell that. And then sometimes you can and it will add just a little bit of visual texture. In it so that's just pretty much something you discover as you do this more and more so I, I like to tell hand spinners to decide on the level of perfection you want out of your yarn based on what you like and what you want to do with it and reach for it and then as you're reaching for it you'll discover places where you can leave off or you know do shortcuts you kind of have to know when I was spinning for trade I asked you know my clients what did you want out of this hand spun you know if you just want nice hand spun you can work with that's great if you want a particular thickness of yarn I can create particular thicknesses of yarn um, I don't have any problem going up and down with thin or thick. It's just a matter of how much to put in the drafting zone. So whatever, how many plies you want, I can achieve that. Um, if you want something very specific and you want it as smooth as possible, hey, I can do that too. I am all about honing my craft and I can do it right and I can cut myself a little slack and not be quite so exacting when I need to be. There was some, um, I gotta find it, there's some historical data on how much a hand spinner, you know, could spin in the process of a day and it's historical, so we're assuming that those hand spinners were doing nothing else but spinning. 
all day long, pretty much for hours. And so I, I think I did a video a while ago where I timed myself and showed how much fiber I could spin in a certain amount of time. It was very interesting. So I'm getting to the end of the fiber. I only have this much left. And now it just occurs to me that this silly heater is in the camera shot. But So I have to apologize for that. Okay, now I, I'm going to see if I can find that measurement. I want to say that, um, you know what? I, at one point I was doing a pound a day, which was good enough for me. Anything more than that and, uh, you know, it kind of aggravates the uh, tendonitis. But what I wanted to say in my final closing is I wind this down and probably the next thing you'll see, whether it's this video or another one, is me cranking the scarf on the Centro when I talk about pocket scarves and shawls. But <clears throat> uh, it was asking a group this year, and it gets asked every once in a while, whether or not uh, anyone has a woolly winder and whether they ever would purchase one. Uh, a long time ago, when I first had my Louette, of course, they didn't have woolly winders for the Louette. So that wasn't really an option. But also, I've, I've heard something about woolly winders is that when you're spinning really thin yarns, that um, it's a lot of uptake, causes uptake and makes it hard to spin thinner yarns. I don't know if that's still true. And I never really spun a lot of thin yarns until now, so I could see that being an issue. And then, of course, I had the Louette, and it was like, I called it a fiber alligator because that thing really had some serious uptake. So it didn't seem like a woolly winder. Anyway, it was a good idea for it. But mostly, woolly winders are terribly expensive. I mean, they cost more than my Louette did. So I never really thought it was a thing I was going to be able to purchase anyway. And I have to say, at the speed that I am going, um... It's probably a good idea that after a certain, you know, length of fiber that I'm actually taking a break and switching the hooks myself. It's, I think it's much better for my wrist and any other joints involved. With that woolly winder, I wouldn't have to take that break and most likely I would not take that break. And so I, I would forget and perhaps do myself more harm uh, without those breaks. And I mean, I fill a bobbin and I can fill a bobbin pretty accurately and I'm not having any issues packing in, you know, four to six ounces or more, depending on which um, machine I'm using, whether it's the Louette or the Ladybug, you know, you can't really get that much on the country classic, the country craftsman. But um, well, at any rate, so I'm, I'm not really convinced that a woolly winder is a thing that I must have. Uh, though those people who enjoy them, you know, say it is a, a great thing for, you know, spinners, especially production spinners, but I'm okay with this, you know, two second hook change and the space it kind of gives me and the break it reminds me to take. Not a problem. Okay, I'm going to go ahead. And I'm going to finish this out because I'm almost done. After I finished this right here, I have a little bag of Cheviot. Just going to add to the end of it. And then I'm going to wind it off and ply it with the Suffolk over here. Then I will be ready to knit it up. I'm going to knit it up on the Centro, the circular knitting machine. And I will talk about that. I've filmed like three different videos on the Centro. I've never been satisfied with any of the three that I've filmed. So I might just start again and do the pocket shawl completely. We'll see. All right, thanks for watching. I'm at the Dye Lab here in Praxis Studios in Cleveland, and here is the finished hand spun yarn. Uh, I'm going to dye one blue and one yellow, 
Now, we all know that yellow and blue make green, and that's precisely what I don't want. So, I, instead of putting them in the crock pot, which is something I normally do, I'm going to do them separately in these dip dye baths. So I have my very hot yellow dye solution. And my very hot blue dye solution. I'm gonna get them pretty close, but not super close. There's a little bit of green in the middle. I'm not gonna be you know, too terribly upset about it, but I really like, would like to avoid it at all cost. I pre-soaked the yarn in water just to make sure. I did not add anything to it prior to that. I normally don't add citric acid or vinegar as a pre-soak to my yarn. There are good reasons as to why you would or should, but none of them apply for me. And here in the dye studio, I am using citric acid. And you might wonder if there's a difference between citric acid and vinegar. Uh, yeah, there is. The biggest difference between the two for me is I don't have to use as much citric acid as I do vinegar. But I tend to use vinegar because it's just really easy for me to go pick up. As opposed to citric acid, I really can't get it anywhere unless I order it. And it's not worth ordering for me unless I do it in bulk, which I just, I haven't needed to in the past few years. That will more than likely change. Uh, and of course, vinegar has the smell. If you don't like the vinegar smell, then you're probably not going to want vinegar. And that, of course, is a very valid reason. Okay, so I'm going to make sure that this covers everything equally. I really did consider laying it all out and um, painting it. And I got to say that painting stains. Um, it's not really a happy place for me. I didn't really, I didn't enjoy it. Let me just say. I didn't enjoy it. It's really messy. Lots of people do it. So I'm not saying don't do it or it's a terrible thing or criticizing any of that. I just did not enjoy it. And I found that I am a much more effective dyer when I use the crock pot. And I would have used the crock pot for this, of course, if I was not at Praxis. I don't know if they have a crock pot here. I need to find out. There's a lot of stuff here. Okay, I am just trying to get that all down there. And I'm going to have that space in the middle, and that is okay. In my view, I would rather have this space to be um, natural or white than green. Though, as I'm seeing from over here, I think some green is going to be unavoidable. Uh, now, if you saw the other video, as you remember, this particular skeins of yarn are composed of different wools. They're all, uh, let me think before I say that, Suffolk, Hampshire, Dorset, Cheviot. Yes, they are all either down or hill breeds, so they behave rather similar, but they're not all the same, so I don't 
expect take up of die to be the same throughout this entire, uh, these entire skeins. I just don't, and I'm okay with that. That's perfectly all right. Very, very rarely, almost never, am I actually trying to get a solid color. I'm a, uh, approximately solid colors are, are good enough because I think that adds character to the yarn. It gives a little depth. So it's okay if it's not uh, completely uniformly solid all the way through. Now, normally what I would do is I have the saran wrap here. And I would cover these guys to keep the heat in. I hate this stuff. It's like the devil to use. Gonna cover this. And then what I would do, maybe I'll turn it this way. Cover this with the towel. Okay, there we go. That'll just keep the heat in a little bit longer. I may or may not need to microwave this. I might. The last batch I did, I put it on the saran wrap and I microwaved it. Okay, see I've got a tiny bit of overlap and a tiny bit of cream and a tiny bit of natural. And we are okay. And I have gloves. I actually, they're sitting around the counter. I said to myself, today I am going to wear my gloves. And here I am already in the, the thick of this, about to reach for the yarn with no gloves on. Wear your gloves, people. I am wearing my mask. Okay, I think to me that is close enough. Any closer, I'm gonna get some unwanted greens. And that looks pretty uniform, actually. I'm gonna cover that. Before I completely cover, I'm gonna add a little extra hot water to that. extra hot water to the sky over here. Now that I'm on this side, I see a few spots I'd like to add a little something something to. Okay, I'm gonna cover that, let that do its thing. And then you'll see if the skeins, well, I'll tell you afterwards whether or not I put them into the microwave or not, but you'll be able to see how they work up because the next section I'm gonna show you as I'm cranking them with the Centro 48 needle. Some time has passed, uh, a little more than half an hour, probably a little more than that, 
and as you can see this is pretty good uh, I put some extra yarn in just to soak up some more dye it doesn't need to be this color uh, this is pretty well exhausted there's some left over but you know what dyes don't have to be completely exhausted and water completely clear that doesn't happen with every dye color anyway some colors there is always going to be a little something left in the dye bath and after a while you, you kind of get to know which ones are which so i'm going to go ahead and wash this out and hang it up to dry So the Centro is ready to use. Now this is not a Centro video, how to use video, nor is this really a tutorial on how to make the pocket shawl. It's more like a process video, so you can see how I make something from start to finish. So I'm not going to get into really how to use the machine. Uh, just to tell you that this is the Centro 48 needle. I'm going to just crank. And then afterwards, I will show you the finished product. Now, I'm going to put this on time lapse. And what you'll see is about an hour of me cranking condensed into roughly a minute. So you'll see the whole process from start to finish. But you won't have to watch me crank for an hour. Then after the time lapse video, I will take it off and show you. Um, how I'm going to assemble it and what it looks like for the final piece. I packed the order when it occurred to me that I hadn't shown you what the final project looks like. So I'm going to go ahead and unpack this. Uh, this is one of the headbands that I made on the circular sock machine. It's a little different than the headbands that I make on the Centro, uh, of course, because the yarn is thinner and the stitch count works out differently because of that. This one is a cotton wool blend sock yarn. All right, let me go ahead and open this up so you can see what it looks like. 